All right, welcome everyone. I'm really excited about this panel. What I'm going to do is I'm going to allow everyone to introduce themselves very quickly so we can get down to the meat of the questions. And we're going to talk about horrible bosses. All right. Starting here, go. Me? I'm opening the ball. Do I look like I've had horrible bosses? You're like, if you started a company, it's because you've had horrible bosses. 100%. <laughs> You're like, fuck that shit. 100%. <laughs> I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> Um, horrible bosses. Okay, I'm gonna say this. Whoa, introduce yourself first. Oh, Quick intro, people sorry. know who yeah, you are. Yeah. Sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Reem Salmi from Fractal CMOs. So Fractal is uh, a marketing launchpad. I have chief marketing officers that I place in early stage startups. We help them go to market, scale, and fundraise. And as part of that, we do these exclusive VC and founder brunches around the world to help with the fundraising. All right, Amber. Perfect. Um, I'm Amber Scott. I'm the chairperson and a strategic advisor at Outlier Compliance Group. Um, I just handed over the reins as CEO. So there's a, a slight irony in my being on a CEO panel in that that was true up until last week. Um, but we're a compliance consulting firm. We aim to keep folks out of trouble in the regulatory space. So I'm Jacqueline Cooper, and I'm an attorney but also an educator, and I have many hats, as some of you might know. Uh, I'm the creator of the Blockchain Legal Institute, which is actually a centralized library for decentralized resources. And then I also have a nonprofit, the Blockchain Legal Institute Foundation, which helps support the creativity of my side, which I'm the author of the Bitcoin Cinderella Blockchain Adventure Series, which is really STEM, talking about blockchain, it's Harry Potter on, on chain. And I'm really excited to be here because of everything that uh, we're going to be sharing today. All right, so let's get into it. Reflecting on leaders you've had in the past, what leadership traits and behaviors did you find deplorable and that has affected your leadership style moving forward? Okay, one thing that I try to be uh, very, very mindful of is... I think when you, we don't know how much time or energy something takes for somebody else. It's really hard to assess. And so over delegating and expecting things to happen very fast because you're not the one doing it, I think is something I've experienced as uh, a CMO myself for another uh, founder. And then now I try to be very mindful of that with my team, trying to be like very reasonable with the expectations even when I don't know how long or how much energy something takes. And I think it's really good for morale to be mindful of that. So biggest lesson, I think. All right, Amber. I think one of the, the books that's been most influential on me is this book, Invisible Women. Um, and for me, as a CEO, that was incredibly transformative. And it's a book about how, as women, we're not kind of considered in medical studies and all of these other things. But it was a massive insight for me that people with young children don't attend corporate events. And this is because it's so much more complicated. And as soon as I read it, I talked to the folks on my team that had kids and made a decision that, you know what? If you have kids and I want you to come to an event that's in the evening, it's outside of regular work hours, I'm gonna pay for a babysitter. And that's just a thing and you can bill it and you can expense it and that's not a problem. Um, because I want people to have equality in being able to access those opportunities. And that's not particularly gendered. I will do the exact same thing for men that have children that uh, want to attend events that are outside of regular working hours. But I think often the caregiving falls on us more as women. And being able to be mindful of that and having the immense privilege of making space for people to be able to equally access opportunities um, has been Great. And I, I think something that if you're looking for how do we make life better for people that work with us in our environment, looking for those spaces where you can open up access to opportunities is really important. Um, and looking at how that might be different for different individuals on your team. So I, um, I'm still teaching. I am also practicing law. So during the teaching day, uh, I'm in the educational system, and then after hours, I'm doing my entrepreneurial work. So I've experienced um, leaders on both the traditional side as well as in the entrepreneurial side. 
One of the things, one of the biggest takeaways that I have found is how do you empower people to follow their passions? And on my traditional side, um, I had a principle that was not very empowering to the fact that I had all these outside interests. But those outside interests, I was bringing back to the school, helping with the career day, and really helping having the students understand all these wonderful opportunities that were outside of the school. So that was very um, uh, toxic. And so I realized that it was really important for me to empower other people's passions. And also when I ended up switching from that principle to the next principle, I was honest, I said, look, I need to go to these conferences. I'm writing books, I'm doing this. I'll bring it back to the school and I will help enrich what we're doing in the school. He was fine with that. And again, it had nothing to do with being um, you know, a woman principal versus a male principal, but it was the idea of how do we empower others to follow their passions and be creative and then bring it back to the job or back to the business. Because if we are not empowered, then we are not gonna do our best and we're gonna feel like we're a flower without water. Can I, can I comment on what you just said? Because I think that's brilliant. And there's something that you did in advocating for yourself in that that I want to highlight. And that's that when you brought it back, it wasn't just about this is what I'm interested in, but it was I'm going to bring this back, I'm going to teach, I'm going to educate, I'm going to bring a benefit to the organization. And I think that's a really important point. If you feel like you're not getting the traction in your organization that you want to do what you want to do, look for that benefit for the organization and it'll really help you advocate for the change that you want. So but I'm actually going to add to that now. What I say to people going in, communication is key. And as CEOs, if you are not taking the time to sit with your C-suite executives to find out what their needs are, you're an idiot. I always say, no, at the level that these people add on the panel, we're all rock stars. We're rock stars. And if we don't work out, it's because we did not communicate our needs to each other. You have to take the time. A lot of CEOs or companies will hire somebody and then leave and expect that person to be able to just figure shit out. Mm -hmm. You have to communicate and have a relationship and take the time to sit down with your key people and go, how can I help you? What do you need to empower you and hire people and allow them to become rock stars. 100%. Right? But the, the, one, the other thing I just would add, it's not easy conversations to have. And with different individuals, they might not be accepting of the path that you're on. And you just have to figure out how do you communicate that and how do you find a balance. And you might not find that balance, you might just be in a one-way toxic situation. And that happens a lot at a very high level. It just is what it is, right? It's horrible bosses exist and they have power. All right, next question. What is the most unconventional decision you made that led to your success? I'll start with that one. Um, for me, very early on in my professional career, I struggled with my dual identity as a human, which is on one side, I'm a full-on artist. I'm a singer, I'm a songwriter, I'm an actress, I'm a dancer, and I have that on Instagram. And then on the other side of my life, I am the founder of Fractal, a marketing agency for the blockchain space, and I have all of this technical side of me. And for the longest time, I tried to keep them separate because I thought it was delegitimizing, I guess, to be like this bubbly person on Instagram and then being like closing these big deals. And, um, and I think the thing that has helped me the most is when I reconciled the two and I accepted that actually that is what makes me a great marketer is the fact that I'm an artist, is the fact that I'm a little bit more sensitive. Um, that's what makes the events, I think, also really successful, is because I've planned tours before, I've done concerts, I've done all these things. So a big crowd for me, like managing a crowd, is part of what being an artist is, and I think that's what is making me different in the space. And so today I'm embracing those two. It's still a challenge. It's still a challenge where I'm just like, oh, is this too much for LinkedIn, you know? 
But every time I see, but every time I think, is this too much for LinkedIn? I'm like, fuck it, I'll do it. And then the response is so good. The response is so good. People are like, oh my God, a normal human. Like, can we stop with the, I am so proud to announce that, you know? Like, you know what I mean? Like, can we just like be real for a second? And so the posts are doing really well because I bring the artist into the founder, CEO part of my life. I love that. I feel that in my soul. I feel like the best <laughs> advice that I got before I founded Outlier was someone sat down and said, at a certain point as a leader, you either have to figure out what your authentic voice is or you hit a ceiling. So all of that wacky, weird, wonderful, much muchness, all of that you-ness mm. that sometimes you think is too much to bring, those are the things that actually make you great. If I called you average, if I called you oh. mid, normal, <laughs> right? oh, how dare you? I am not no. normal. <laughs> so I think bring it. Like all, all of that yourself, bring it because it's part of your strength. And anyone that tells you that that shit is a weakness, they've got some jelly in their belly. Like and they've got their own stuff to sort out and that exactly. is not about you. That is Ex about them. Yeah, it's not about you. I love you on that. Mm -hmm. Because look at this. Like, you, you look like a successful artist. You oh, thank look, you. <laughs> you know when you walk into a room, you command. Thank you, thank you. And I love yeah, that. I said, that's it. That's all I, it's like, if it's not for you, it's, it's not for you, but that's it. 100%. It's, it's for right. my people, and I'll find my people. Jacqueline. Yeah. So, I think the, and I don't know if it's unconventional, but I, I realized, and it, it might be just because of the experience, um, the biggest lesson that I realized was don't let others dim your light. Um, a lot of times people say, well, how, when do you sleep? Or how do you do everything that you do? And I, I have a lot of degrees. I'm a career switcher. Mm -hmm. But I follow my passion. And I've, I have a 27-year-old daughter who's doing great things. And I tell her, follow your passion. Mm -hmm. Because if you're following what you love, it's not a job, doesn't feel like work, and it gives you energy. And a lot of times that might be intimidating to others. And I have to respect that not everyone might want to do what I'm doing, and that's okay. So I also try to empower others that it's okay not to do everything that I'm doing because I'm doing me. And everyone is a different thumbprint. So everyone is unique. So be yourself, be authentic for you. You don't have to mimic someone else, but that was a really hard lesson for me to learn. Just, you know, follow my path, but include others within that path, because we have to, we're, we're not solo in this human experience. And so that's, that was the, the biggest lesson that I've learned that I think as a CEO or as um, creator of companies or projects, I try to always uh, emulate. All right. So ladies, if you could send a time-traveling business card or QR code to your younger self, what piece of advice would you give your younger you? Uh, um, to stop looking for the adult in the room. There is no adult in the room. <laughs> there's no adult in the room. Like, there's literally, you just have to do it. And a lot of time, I think we're, ta we're taught by the system that there is somebody else out there that knows better. Um, and especially as women, I think we tend to over-prepare and over this because we think, oh, there's some bigger person out there that knows better how to run this thing or how to do these things. But honestly, if you feel like you have the information, a lot of the time there really isn't a bigger person out there and it's just about trying it and failing fast and doing it. So I wish I would have failed faster instead of gathering more information for perfection, for maybe a, a more perfect outcome. I think if, if I could go back and tell my younger self something, it would be to take more risk. And that's maybe a funny thing to say as a risk manager. I <laughs> love the early ex career experiences that I had working at Fortune 500 companies, working at banks, doing all those things. That, that was an incredibly valuable experience. But if I'm honest with myself, a lot of my career path were things that I chose because I wanted a stable salary and I wanted benefits and I had student loans to repay. 
And I did a lot of the things that I thought that I was supposed to do. Mm. There were a lot of supposed to's. I'm supposed to wear the blue power suit. I'm supposed to have a specific aesthetic. Um, and that was, I, I think, when we talk about the authentic part, all of the supposed to for me ha was incredibly inauthentic mm. in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I started taking the risk of following things not because I was guaranteed a salary, but because frankly, I was really pissed off about how consulting firms worked and I thought I could do it better and no one else was gonna give me permission. Like no one else, if, you ha if you're like, I think this is how something should be done. This is how this problem should be solved. And you feel really passionate about it, start a damn company and solve your problem. Mm -hmm. Don't wait for somebody else to do it for you. Mm -hmm. Nobody else is gonna do it for you, but you can do it. Like you have it in your heart, you're pissed off, you know how to do it better. That's what entrepreneurship is about. Take the risk. When I meet young entrepreneurs, I am so filled with joy. And it doesn't matter if you succeed or you fail, you start this life of taking the risk of solving problems that are doing things that are meaningful for you and that's a beautiful life. Mm -hmm. And I, I want that for people. I want people to be doing the things that they're passionate about. My only regret about starting a company at 35 was that I didn't do it at 25. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, my card to myself would be embrace your inner child. Mm -hmm. Because that's why I, I haven't retired yet from teaching. Every time that I work with a kindergartner and they look at new things with awe and because they just discovered something that they didn't know, that to me is how we should all, uh, I would like to keep going through life and that's why I love the blockchain and our world because I'm constantly learning new things and that's, you know, that um, inquis uh, being inquisitive about new things and having joy and playing and having fun, I think, is something that um, makes what we do um, incredible. So that's something that I try to every day uh, when I, you know, I'm thinking about what my plans are. I say, okay, what am I doing that's making me happy today? And uh, because there's enough other things that will not. But I always want to make sure that what I'm doing is going to bring joy because at the end of the day, I want to look back and say, I had fun because we are only living one life experience. So mm -hmm. I want to make sure that during this life, I can enjoy it myself and also give it back to others. Nice. One thing I'm going to add, it kind of touches on what uh, was said earlier about fail often. I was raised to never quit. That's how mm -hmm. I was raised. I think that is such a piece of bullshit advice. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> if you hate something and you've done everything you could to push that, give it a big fuck you and move on. Quit. I had my daughter in hockey and she had one of those coaches that was like, Ugh, and she was like five. She came off the ice and I said, she was crying. And I said, did you hate it? I hated it. Well, we're going to quit. Because life's too short to be in a toxic, spilling situation that is not bringing you joy. So take more risks, fail often, and don't be afraid to quit. Well, remember, yeah. fail. We, we teach the kids, fail is really first attempt in learning. So really, a lot of times you have to do things more than once in order for you to learn it. So. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is our rock star panel of female CEOs and thank founders. You. Thank you, thank you, thank you.